everyone. Welcome to our Life, A Greater Way of Living Bible Study, where we are looking at Matthew chapter 5 to 7, and we've been doing that for a number of weeks now. Um, this is actually my third and last week before I hand it over to another teacher, which is Jacob, and he will be recording and taking it from the United States. <laughs> so um, we covered a number of sections in the past few weeks. Um, last week, we looked at murder, and uh, I have the section outlined here for all of you, right? So, this section taken from Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, 31 to 48, is quite a lot to cover, um, but I'll just go through really some of the key points. We talked about murder and adultery last week, and we realized that, um, again, the whole formula of uh, this is what has been it's, it's being this is what been taught to you, and Jesus then comes and says, "But I say to you." Yeah, remember that that formula where we talked about um, is also applicable in all these sections here. And we talked about murder, and it was an act condemned by the Pharisees, but they missed the spirit of it. We saw that last week. We saw how Jesus actually took each and every one of these sections, and uh, as I will show you, how he expanded on the teachings and he went deeper on it. Right? Jesus was not focused on being religious, but rather focused on righteousness. And a lot of the righteousness He focuses on comes from the heart. It starts in our hearts. That's what He drives, the point He drives at. And He gives numerous examples of how that works. So for example, murder. Yes, the act is wrong, but we shouldn't just thinking as long as we don't commit murder, we are all okay. But what's more important is there are certain things we can do in our hearts which bears the same weight of wrongdoing, right? In this case, Jesus talks about, hey, just look at murder. Look at your inner motives and intentions. Anger which is to judge the upon same way one who commits murder as well. Adultery, Jesus takes the same direction. And God is just not concerned about the act of adultery, but the motives behind it, that you can also commit adultery just through you lusting after the person of the opposite sex, and it is judged in the same manner. So there we can see that it's so important of how... ...to not fall into sin. Today we will cover four more sections where we will look at divorce, swearing falsely, retaliation, true love. And I want to encourage all of you, just because those words are up there, don't switch off, oh no, that's not me, or read, you know, big deal. It's like an onion, okay? So you have the picture of the onion. No picture of onion, okay, never mind. But as an and you know you have the skin, and as you so on, right? So that's where we, we actually see Jesus doing. The Pharisees would he would peel away the outer layer to show what's deeper in terms of what matters to God. Just like an onion has many layers. He also will have many layers. So let's start with divorce, taken from verse 31 and verse 32. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, verse 31 to 32. And it goes like this. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery and Anyone who marries a divorced wife, a divorced woman, commits adultery. You know, often when we read this verse, we say, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, and we get hung up there. We get hung up on, okay, see, Jesus says, you go sexual immorality, okay, then can divorce. And, they, and we try to figure out what are all the other things which we can add to it, which gives us grounds for divorce. But when we do that, we miss the point. And in here, the Pharisees also miss the point. They were teaching anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. They were so hung up about the idea that you are divorced, can, as long as you got cert. cert. Huh? Sometimes we are, oh, you want to do this, got cert or not, got license or not. 
your license for divorce according to the Pharisees certificate. And to get that certificate, it was very easy in the day. Evidence that if a man, a man can divorce his wife if, if based on very trivial reasons, simple reasons, a bad cook for trust in the wife, and that can already cause for divorce with the local courts at that time. Here Jesus comes and says in verse 32, just as he said in all his previous But I tell you, but I tell you, and this is Jesus saying, hey, listen up. This is important. We see Jesus stand and explaining that it's not about for more importantly, how God sees marriage as important. We too must ask ourselves, you know, when we look at our current situation, when we look at how marriage is you, is it just a leap people take on? Is there something wrong with the mic? Sound check. Is that better? Okay. Apologies for that. So coming back to this, let me just, you know, in case you were listening to me in and out. Um, here we have Jesus telling the Pharisees, you know, I know you are teaching that divorce, as long as you get the certificate, and it's very easy to get the certificate, if someone wants to divorce his wife, you can have a simple reason like being a bad cook. Or, oh, yeah, I've lost interest. Never mind, let me go apply to the Jewish leaders for a certificate of divorce. And it really makes marriage a very trivial thing. Jesus comes here and wakes everyone up and says, but I tell you, marriage is more than that. Jesus, rather than focusing on what a person can do to get out of a marriage, He focuses on what a marriage is about and how important it is to God. That whole institution of a marriage between a man and a wife is so important to God. So when Jesus speaks to us here, we need, in our current situation in 2021, we need to examine the culture surrounding us and our own beliefs about marriage. Because the importance of marriage, the sanctity of marriage, the God-given um, power or the God-given Grace in marriage has been eroded. We look anywhere in the media, we see a normal part of life. Divorce happens everywhere. The rates are high. Certain things, in certain ways, people do things. It's so easy to divorce. We see modern families, a mixed mass of children from marriages as a result from damaged relationships. Jesus here reminds us in verse 32 that when divorce happens, there are long-term consequences. In this case, the consequence is to the wife. She becomes a victim of adultery and stigmatized. Anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery is stigmatized. So when the divorce happens, the consequences are prolonged. The consequences are long and deep. So as we heed the call of Jesus, He says, but this I tell you, Jesus peels the onion back and goes to a deeper teaching. And He refocuses our thoughts on what really is important. It's not about what, this verse is not about what we can do to get out of a, mar a marriage. Not, our, not what rules there are exist to get a divorce. But more importantly, if we see the, the next parts of, of Jesus' teaching that it is how important a marriage is and what are the reasons we must have to keep our marriages together. Let me explain. In verse 32, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Often we are hung up on the rules. 
If you see later on in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus actually expands on this teaching about marriage a little bit more. Matthew chapter 19 verse 3 to 6 says this, Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? You can see actually it's related huh, to verse 31. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, this is what Jesus said, the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. It's not about how to get out of a marriage but it is about why we should keep marriages strong. It should be why we should sustain our marriages, why we should invest in the marriage institution, whether invest time, money or energy. It is worth it because it is from God. It is from the Creator who created them male and female. And we see that being eroded. Anything else other than a male and female situation where the two marry together, join in one flesh, anything other than that is not a God-defined idea of marriage. Here Jesus draws our attention to the godly and God-given nature of marriage. So we ourselves need to examine that. We need to ask ourselves, what do we really think about marriage in the light of the culture around us? Is it a free flow, anything happens, don't feel like it anymore, or I've fallen out of love with this person, or I've been distracted, or, you know, I've done this, or I've done that, therefore, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to give up on my, on my marriage, I'm going to go for a divorce. The question is not what are the grounds for divorce, but more importantly, because marriage is so important to the eyes of God. And let us remember that the question should be, what can we do to strengthen our marriage, to protect it, to keep it, and to respect what God has set aside for it? For husband and wives, because the, the marriage bond is vital to our society, what steps are you taking? And I'm asking that myself. What step are we taking to keep our marriages strong in the light of the MCO? I hear of people going out, you know, now we cannot go for dates, right? But, you know, we, 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 we try, maybe go buy coffee together. Two people can still be in the car, <laughs> okay? Tapau back home, you know, and kind of like pretend you're at the cafe. But it doesn't matter. The important is you're investing time. Invest time. Online courses abound. Online videos on YouTube, how to strengthen your marriage. This is something we guys maybe need to step up a little bit, isn't it? Read up. Don't shy away from enrichment courses. Get informed. It's worth the investment. Why? Because God has ordained this to be the way we move forward in life. The reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is how God intended it to be. Are there grounds for divorce? Yes, but that's not my intention. I don't think that was Jesus' intention because He only spent about three words on it. So in the same way, I will not deal with that today. The focus is marriage. Keep it strong because it's important to God. The next section is this. We look at oaths. Not oaths, huh? Oaths is something I eat in the morning. Oaths, okay? <laughs> to make a vow or to make a promise which can be held up in court, all right? And this is what hap what's happening in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 to verse 37. It, it goes like this. Let's, let's read it together. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Here again, we talked about that onion, right? 
the outer layer is what was being taught. Jesus peels away the outer layer to go deeper. And there was a culture of practice back then that Jews used to swear, and now we're not talking about foul language type swearing. I just had a discussion there with my children, and I told them this is not about that kind of swearing, you know, not using the, the F-bomb or anything like that. We're not talking about that. Okay, that's a different discussion altogether. But now we're, we're talking about how the practice of the Jews last time was, they, in order to convince another person that they were telling the truth, they would make an oath, you know. For us now, it is maybe what's relevant is we, we go to the commissioner of oath, you know, you, you get your document certified. How do you know that you didn't forge this document? You bring the original to a person called the commissioner of oaths, Okay, and then you show the person, the person look at the original and look at your photocopy and chop the photocopy and say, confirm, this is an original copy. Or, okay, or maybe it's a photocopy of your IC, they will compare. And that's what we use to, to, in our applications and say, hey, you know, back then they didn't have these photocopies. Right? So what they did was they used to say, okay, um, in order to prove that I'm telling you the truth, I would swear on my mother's grave, for example, <laughs> in order to prove they were telling the truth. But there's a bit more elaborate lah, because as time went by, they chose all kinds of things to swear over. Swear on your head, swear by heaven, swear on earth, swear by the temple gates. After a while, it got pretty crazy. Here Jesus says, He peels the onion back, He goes deeper in the teaching, He expands it and says that God values us to be a person of our word. Actually, technically, the reason you, you, you need to find all these things to prop up yourself so that people will believe you is because maybe you come across not as a trustworthy person. Now, I guess in our application, sometimes we have no choice but to go to the commissioner of oath, get things chopped because people have actually taken the system for granted and they've abused it. You know, people have forged documents before, so they have come across, uh, they, they say, okay, from now on, all need to have the commissioner of oath certify. A CTC, Certified True Copy. That wouldn't be necessary if nobody cheated, right? <laughs> and it's the same thing here, isn't it? Jesus is saying, you don't have to swear by your head, na? swear by your heaven, and, or heaven or the temple gates or whatever you're swearing, because God values us to be a people of our word. In verse 37, it says this, Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Just backtrack a little bit. Jesus says, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Right? Because back then, you don't have to do this. Come across as trustworthy. Be trustworthy in all that you say. Let your yes be a yes or your no be a no. Don't have to take an oath either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, in verse 35, or by earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. It is pointless to swear by any of these, Jesus is saying, because all these come from God. What is more important that is not what we swear upon, but our inward motives when we make a promise. If we are really truthful and honest, then there's no need for additional proof. And again, Jesus talks about this in verse 37. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more from this comes from evil. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's look at what the Living Bible puts it and how it puts it in this way. Uh, can I have the verse, please? Say just, say just a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Your word is enough to strengthen your promise with a vow, show that something shows that something is wrong, isn't it? That's, that's, what, that's another way of saying this. In the light of the context of the Sermon on Mount, this is what we Christians are called to be and do. Our word needs to be our bond. And in this situation, the Pharisees were trying to escape it by actually having all kinds of ways to prove that they were telling the truth. You do not need that, Jesus says. Live a life where when you say something, people will know it will be done. If you can't, you get back and say, no, certain things are not working out. But you're truthful, 
and you're honest. And in essence, this is the life we are called to live. Remember when we started talking about the Sermon of the Mount, how Jesus is calling us to live a life which is different from the world around us. Jesus is calling us to live what they call a counter-cultural lifestyle, a lifestyle which goes against the situation and the culture around us. In our culture, people say anything they want and within a few weeks, they take it back or deny all knowledge that they ever said it. Our public figures are making it worse by setting so bad examples, telling outright lies, but they still can be put in public positions. Politicians, we won't go there, but I think you know what I mean. Many go against their word. The question for us in a more practical and realistic sense is, how are we, how is our word to our friends? When we say something, do they say, the guy say you need I mean, I work with certain people, unfortunately, when they say that they will meet certain, do certain things, I will like, okay, let's put in some safeguards to make sure the person does it. I'll call the person one week before, la, okay, two days before, I'll follow up some more, la, on the day itself, I'll message the fellow, hey, you gonna, and so on and so forth. And I think this is something we all have to work at and work on. That if we say we're trying to do something, let it be such that ah, people will realize mm, we can trust this person. This person is one you can rely upon and trust upon. If we examine ourselves and find that we are often having to prove to others, whether it's by some additional promise or you know, that we can be trusted, that means there is already a trust deficit. And we need to work that get, to get that back in some areas of our life. I'm also speaking to myself here at times. We need to realize that this is what Jesus values. The integrity to simply say yes or no. Because anything more comes from evil. Now, that's an interesting thing, thing huh? in verse 37. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. That means if you have to back up and have have to actually add on some additional uh, promises to prove that you're going to do it, maybe your intention wasn't to do it correctly in the first place. That's what Jesus says. Anything more than this comes from evil. And he's talking about the Pharisees there. Actually, maybe you were actually planning to cheat. Maybe you were actually planning to go back against your word. That's why you have to have all this added on. So for us, our word is very important. When we say something, can we be trusted or not? Jesus says you must be trusted. This is us as followers of Christ. That's our branding, you know, they say. <laughs> you know, we talk about personal branding, right? As Christians, we also have our brand, you know, salt and light, okay, blessed are the meek. That's our brand, when people think about Christians, they must be thinking about, and when people think about followers of Jesus, the brand image which comes to the top of their mind is, oh, these guys can be trusted. If they say they'll do something, more often than not, unless it's a catastrophe, they will do it. And that actually applies not just in our verbal communication, right? It's also in the way we connect in WhatsApp. Now, so we connect so much online. We connect so much using our mobile devices. Sometimes our, our WhatsApp etiquette, our texting etiquette, actually brings ourselves and the name of God to shame. And I'm, I have, I'm very mindful of this. I have to be extra cautious because sometimes, you know, with so many texts coming in, we forget to reply, you know, and we don't, don't apologize quick enough. We have to be also aware that it's not just verbal communication, it's also written communication, which people will also see, oh yeah, this guy, huh? it's always like that. And that's something we all need to work at at times, to build up our trustworthiness, not only when we speak, but when we text. That's the second thing which Jesus talked about. All this is in the context of what it means to be righteous rather than religious. You know. God wants us to be righteous, not religious. God wants us not just, uh, it's not just about following rules. Yeah, there are some rules to follow. He didn't deny that. 
But it goes more than that, the state of our heart, God looks upon that. And our heart can do things which is of the same weight and brings the same consequences as our actions. Divorce is one. Oaths is another. Murder, we talked about. Adultery. And the next section is retaliation. Right, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 to 39a, which is just the first part of that verse. And there are actually four subsections to, uh, to that, those few verses. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 to 39a goes like this. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Now, here we, you know, we need to understand the context and the background of this situation. We see the Pharisees using what was meant for the court system. Uh, in this case, eye and eye and tooth for tooth. And actually encouraging them to apply something was, which was meant for the courts. Only the law courts can take this principle and use it and exact punishment, okay, if you do something wrong, you take it to the law courts, they will then say, okay, what concept we will follow? We will follow this called an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, okay? It's also what we call the lex talionis, or I mean, which is eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Basically, have you ever wondered, you know, how they decide, huh? if let's say you were to, um, let's say, beat somebody up, how do they decide, for example, uh, how much punishment to give you if you were found guilty? This is the concept. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And it's, it's the same one used back then during the Jewish times. But what they were doing, what was meant just for the courts, they took it and said, you must use that in your personal relationships as well. Whoever does you something, you must do back to that person. Whoever hurts you, you must hurt back. And therefore, it starts personal vendettas, grudges, revenge. Wow, and we know how bad that can be in some cultures, isn't it? Some cultures can hold revenge, can hold hurt, can hold anger and grief against another person for a long time because they're just waiting for the time to release that vengefulness. Whether it's in a painful way of saying in, or is in actual physical harm. Because this can, Jesus is saying you cannot use what is meant for the courts in your personal relationship because God expects something different from all of us in our personal relationships. God doesn't expect if somebody hits you, you hit back. It says here, no. It says in verse 39a, but I tell you again, wake up for us. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If somebody does something evil to you, that evil person does something evil to you, do not retaliate. And this next two, retaliation and the one after this, true love, uh, according to many writers, is the hardest of all. It's the pinnacle. It's the toughest thing to follow. Do not resist an evil person. What Jesus meant here, again contradicting the Pharisees, is that when we encounter someone evil and are affected by that person, we are not to retaliate. We cannot apply the concept of retribution, in this case, eye for an eye, two for two, in our personal lives. Only the law courts can do that. He's not dismissing the law courts. There is a place for retribution. There's a place for punishment. But that's not in our hands. This is the standard of those who follow Jesus. This is the counterculture we are asked to live in our relationships. Don't hold grudges. Don't look for avenues where we can get even. And Jesus goes on. And he, Jesus takes the effort to share four examples, four practical applications on how to, to demonstrate what He meant. In the first example is Matthew chapter 5, verse 39b, the second part of the verse. It says this, If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, if anyone slaps me, I will make a police report. Okay? <laughs> Jesus is saying here, you don't do that. But the point he's trying to say here is don't hold a grudge. Examine the situation. Don't retaliate. Go the extra mile to find out what brought about that situation in love. Love is the understanding and under, 
undergrounding concept. The next example he gives in Matthew chapter 5, verse 40. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. I mean, somebody wants to sue me, I, I'll go to court, lah, right? Try to settle it there. I wouldn't just say, okay, you take everything. That's not what he means here. What Jesus means here is the retaliation must not be there. It's not easy. Of course, it's not easy. Do not retaliate, but more importantly, we are to love. That's the hallmark of a follower of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, the third example Jesus gives is this. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now, no, now people cannot force us, lah, right? I mean, we don't go, we don't go. Lah. But back in those days, you know, a Roman soldier can come along and say, you carry my bags. And Jesus says here, even though this evil person is asking you this, go the extra mile. Do it in love. Do not retaliate. Do not rise up against that person. Example 4, Matthew chapter 5, verse 42, as Jesus goes on, the fourth example given is this, Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, does this mean we have to give everything in every circumstance? Someone comes, asks you nicely, you give everything? No, that's what not it, what it means. In the context of what is being taught here, the key principle is to do things in love. It doesn't mean we are to be doormats. Huh? If you know what a doormat is, is you open the door, there's a mat there, you come and you step all over it. Jesus doesn't say, no, you must be stepped on by everybody, you must be lowest of the pile, you know. You look at how Jesus lived, that's not what he did. He took a non-retaliation policy, that's true. But what he did was he did it in love, that's the second one, but he was also clear to speak about injustices. We see him like that, we see him brave to speak up against the religious leaders who were wrong. This whole sermon on the mount is him speaking up against all the Pharisees who were twisting it. He didn't say, ah, yeah, never mind, lah, they're doing this wrong, never mind, lah, let's forgive them. He didn't say that. We see Jesus going to temples, seeing things were not in order and flipping tables and actually being angry and having a public demonstration of his anger there. He spoke up. He wasn't afraid. He was never afraid of the backlash. It was because he did it in love. And of course, we see in Jesus' final hours on life, of life on earth when he was finally tortured, stripped and beaten. Retribution and revenge was not on his mind. And we are all asked to follow Jesus, isn't it? What was on his mind was love. When he was hanging on the cross, Luke chapter 23, verse 24 says this, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Wow. That's just amazing, isn't it? That's our standard. That's the kind of life we are called to live. Not about, it's not, don't speak up for injustices, never mind, take a quiet attitude. No. It's about not taking revenge, not looking for retaliation. And the last one, Jesus ups the standard a little bit more. Okay, He ups the game a little bit more. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48 says this. Let's turn to that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Here again, same thing. Outer piece of the onion, we see Pharisees saying, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Jesus peels that back to show them, to show where the wrongs were, expands on the teaching. We see actually the Pharisees doing something a bit devious here. They took the law, and actually it's taken from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, you know. 
and they actually took out some and added their own stuff into it. Love your neighbor. The actual law says, love your neighbor, okay, as yourself. They omitted that. And they added in, and hate your enemy. It says nowhere in the Old Testament you read that. They had to trust, and people back then no choice, or they just listened to Nina. That's what, that's, I, I guess that's why Jesus was infuriated by these people. They added to God's word, they took it out, they modified it upon, based on what they were, what was consistent and convenient to them. So, for a person who's a Jew back then listening, oh, I must love my neighbor and hate my enemy, okay, it's good. Jesus says, no, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, that's the extent we go, right? Love our enemies. Yeah, anybody can say we love their enemies, right? How do we actually start doing it? By praying for them. That's a practical application we all can do. Find the person you really dislike in your life. Okay? Find the person you have some grudge against. Break that by saying, I wanna, I'm going to daily pray for this person. Pray that God blesses him. You don't pray that <laughs> you know, that person is, is, will die or something like that, okay? You pray that God blesses that person, helps that person through so that we may be children of your Father in heaven, because as followers of Jesus, that is what we do. We love our enemies and we go the extra mile in love. Not only do we love them, it's not just empty talk, but it's translated to action by praying for that person. And as we do that, as we pray for that person, as we intercede for that person, and we work with the Holy Spirit in our lives, that will then pour out and translate into actual physical love. He causes His Son, the next part of the verse, to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. At the end of the day, whoever you hate or hates you, at the end of the day, they are all children of God. It is all under God's care. He is the one who causes the, the Son to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And here's the other issue. The next question the Pharisees did was they defined who their neighbor was. And it was a strict definition. It's as if you're saying, okay, I will only love my next door neighbor and my right neighbor. Because he says, love your neighbor. Ma. These are two of my neighbors, okay? In front, across the street, not counted. Behind that, also not counted. Only these two. They were like that, huh? But what they did was they basically limited it to the fact that let's just love, as long as we love each other, the Jews. That goes against what God has taught. And as us followers of Jesus, not only do we love people who are in the church, we must look out for those out there who need love, who are different from us and not say, mm, that's, that doesn't cover my neighbor. It's not in the neighbor definition. We don't define it that way. We define it as who God wants us to love. If you love those who love you, what reward would you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And tax collectors were pretty low then, right? But Jesus is saying, go beyond that. If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. So it's not about just loving your own kind. It's about breaking out beyond racist ideas, which sometimes all of us have. It is moving beyond and loving those who are different from us, whether physically different or have different behaviors or different principles. We read in the Old Testament how God cares for everyone under his land, in His land, because He says here He causes the sun to rise on all of them. He sends rain on all of them. God cares for the non-Jews as well, the sojourners, the foreigners, the refugees in their midst, and it's the same standard applied to us. Why? In verse 48, it says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word perfect here is be complete. If you want to be a good follower of Jesus, if you want to be a good, good person before the eyes of the Lord, this is what we do. We love those who are different from us. We love those who people don't love. We care and we go the extra mile for them. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
See, it's not about the rules, isn't it? It's about where our heart lies and how we look out to others. I want to just close this time by reading um, about the life of Martin Luther King. Uh, he was an American preacher in the 60s and he was fighting for civil rights. That means, you know, just because he's a Negro man, uh, a black man, doesn't mean they should be discriminated against and doesn't mean they, they, they should be treated in a different, more lowly manner. And Martin Luther King as a preacher was very influenced by Jesus and the teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, he was assassinated. And at his funeral, one of his close friends, Dr. Benjamin Mays, said this, If any man knew the meaning of suffering, King knew, house bombed, living day by day for 13 years under constant threats of death, maliciously accused of being a communist, falsely accused of being insincere, Stabbed by a member of his own race, slugged, beat up in a hotel lobby, jailed over 20 times, occasionally deeply hurt because friends betrayed him. And yet this man had no bitterness in his heart, no rancor, no evil, evil feelings in his soul, no revenge in his mind. And he went up and down the length and breadth of this world, preaching non-violence, and the redemptive power of love. One of his most moving sermons were based on Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 45, exactly what we're reading here this morning. It was entitled, Loving Your Enemies, wrestling with the questions why and how Christians are to love. He described, hate multiplies hate in a descending spiral of violence and is just and injurious to the person who hates as to his victim. But above all, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend for it has creative and redemptive power. And Martin Luther King and his friends were determined to meet hate with love. Where did he get all these ideas from? It's so countercultural, you know. You beat me up, I'm going to beat you up double. You say these things to me, I'm going to keep it inside. I'm going to wait for the right time. I'm going to say it back to you. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to make you embarrassed. We hold all these grudges. It makes things worse because when we do that to another person, we're only hurting ourselves and the other person too are hurt. Jesus is saying, do not retaliate. Do not meet hate with love, but meet hate. Do not meet hate with hate, but meet hate with love. We've talked about, I know it's been a bit of a whirlwind in the last section, right? But we've really covered quite a lot of ground. And next week we will move on with uh, Jacob. We've talked about murder, adultery, divorce, swearing, swearing falsely. Retaliation, true love, it boils down to our heart. Read it again in your free time. Take out some important lessons for your own personal situation. Share that with your friend. Share that with one another. Drop it on the church, uh, the church chat. And we all may be encouraged by it. Right? So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. I pray that God has been working in your heart, showing you, illuminating you through the power of the Holy Spirit, certain areas which we need to work on, we need to change, that we may have a full life, that we may be righteous. And it's not about rules. It's not about being religious. It's about the state of our heart. God bless you all. Let me pray for all of you this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the teaching which comes from your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit to help us because a lot of these things are not easy. But we thank you that you've sent your helper to us and we can call out to him to help us. Help us to love those who hurt us. Help us to love those who hate us. Help us not to hold grudges, O oh Lord. As a matter of fact, let us start by praying for those we, whom we dislike. 
let us pray for those who have an, an evil eye out for us. And we pray that, that, that the prayer which we start in, in earnest will turn to a loving cause in our heart. Thank you, O oh Jesus, for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. See you all on Wednesday for the prayer, the prayer time. Don't forget Friday is another Friday of praying. And we will see you on Sunday as well. God bless you all. Take care of one another. Stay safe. Because the God